Hope you guys hope you enjoy some lunch. Um, hope you enjoy the weekend. Uh, we're we're here with pleasure to have uh, Chad Crawford. I'm gonna read a little bit about Chad. I I met him and was watching him on television. I met him uh, through Seminole County. And uh, Chad is a he's a local Seminole guardian. He's the owner and creative director of Crawford Group. Um, he's part owner of Black Coffee Multimedia Productions, so the straight freelance producer and director of photography, and also worked on feature films. Started Crawford Group in 2001. Claims his main job is to come up with ideas, and ideas are a king. And he is the host of How to Do Florida with Chad Crawford, a television uh, series, won multiple Emmy Awards. And he has also um, produced uh, an outside club, which is sort of like a How to Do Florida for kids. And he's here to talk about a little bit about uh, just just about creativity. So welcome, Jack Crawford. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, sorry, we're running a little behind. Had some technical issues. Some Mac and PCs were kind of waging war up here. I think Mac is one for now. Um, got a ticket on the way here too, so I'm a little frazzled. Also coming off a little cold, so just bear with me. Um, Orlando's finest were out at it today. And, uh, you know, seeing that officer in front of me, it, it reminded me of being in the Navy. Right out of high school, I went in the Navy, and I can remember being raised in Florida my whole life, and all of a sudden, I was up in Great Lakes, didn't know where I was in Illinois. Um, I was up there with a tank top. Um, I had spent my whole life in Florida surfing, probably spent way too much time in the sun, a little bit, eh, you know, I was that guy. And all of a sudden, I was in the Navy. And I'll never forget standing there uh, on this cold floor in my bare feet with 80 of us lined up, wearing something they call skibbies, which are a little bigger and a little looser than tidy whities but not much. Thinking to myself, like, these, these just aren't my style, you know. So I kept kind of adjusting them and trying to get them to, trying to kind of dial them in a little bit. And my company commander comes up to me, and he's like, what in the hell is wrong with your pants, son? I was like, well, I'm just, just kind of getting them to be my style, you know. This is just, you know. And he grabs the elastic and just <laughs> yanks them up and just, just proceeds to berate me for five minutes, telling me it's all about his style. You're in my Navy. You're government property, and this is how it's going to be. And I remember that moment like, I need to get on board here. And it was the first ass-chewing I had ever had. And it set me in this really good direction. And I started thinking about, you know, ass-chewings in my life. Like, who here has had their ass chewed? I mean, in your face, no holds barred, your ass chewed. There's truth there, isn't there? There is value. I would submit that it's the ultimate act of love. You know, for someone to be in your face like that, unbridled, unfiltered, in that unapologetic format of an ass chewing. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, uh, I got fired from a job for doing something really stupid. And a manager there who I really admired chewed my ass. And it changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. Who do you think you are? What are you doing? And it just it turned me around. So anyway, complete side note. Um, I, I thank you so much for having me here. I want to show you guys a quick video. The fleet has captured the imagination of treasure hunters for almost three centuries. And the fleet was doomed. It's going to be an archaeological <clears throat> bonanza. The holy grail in this is to find a virgin. Someday you eat the bear, and someday the bear eats you. If you come out here and you do this 17 or 18 hours, it feels like somebody's taking a two by four and beating you with it. I've been knocked out, knocked overboard, and hooked in various parts of my body. <laughs> okay, pull. <laughs> <laughs> I've been ran over by an elephant, literally, had my back broken. I've been attacked by a panther, a lion. Ah! Oh. Jordan, can you please get the bearded dragon off the table, please? <laughs> We're deep in the Osa Peninsula rainforest. This is an eyelash viper. Packs quite a punch. Come on, let's go outside. We're going to have some fun outside. <laughs> it's where we are. It's who we are. It's the Outside Outsiders Club. Join us in the kitchen.
kitchen and at our table as we introduce you to Holiday Flavors of Florida. <coughs> Uh, my audio pulled out, didn't it? Let me plug that back in. So, it's a little bit about what I do. I own an entertainment company and uh, have been in this business for about 30 years, which, uh, oh, that sounds crazy. I graduated Full Sail in 95. Who here has heard of Full Sail? Little school right, o right over across the way over there, right? Took me 10 years to pay off my loans. I'm proud of that, actually. Um, it happened when I married a wife who's making a whole lot more money than I was. And she didn't. One little advice here when you marry somebody, let them know what your debt is. You know, just kind of give them a little preview. I had forgotten to tell her that until after we got married. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, for me, uh, my education was a line in the sand. I didn't know anything about film. I wanted to write for Mr. Science Theater 3000. I thought that would be pretty cool. It was one of my favorite things in life. I wanted to be a comedy writer. I wanted to do all these things, but I didn't know anybody. I was like, okay, I'll spend $40,000 of the government's money to try to figure it out. Um, full sale for me was that line in the sand. It was a financial commitment to this industry. And for those of you in this room, that's what you're doing. You're committing your time, your energy to this industry. Without that, I probably would have gone and worked for Dad, making decent money. You know, but because I made that commitment... What you learn, what you take away is irrelevant because we all give and, you know, learn different things. But it is that commitment to this industry that's the most important thing. So, you know, in the past 30 years, we produced over 100 hours of broadcast content, aired it on a lot of these networks behind me, and have had somewhat success. I think today I want to kind of go through that 30 years. Don't worry, it won't take too long. Um, and just kind of give you guys some little nuggets of wisdom, some things that I've picked up along the way, some things you'll connect with, and some of you may not. So my world is video film. So we create television shows. We come up with ideas, and we make something out of nothing. And there's nothing more gratifying than making something out of nothing. Um, recently, I've had a month or so where I didn't have anything to do. I was like, I'm going to make a bed. I've always wanted to make something like that. So I made my wife this bed, and uh, it, it reminded me of what I do. I, I, I create television. It's just, it's, and what you guys make, you guys can't grab a video game unless you put it in the cartridge. It's just this intangible, it's out there. And making a bed, there was something very physical about that that I really like. I kind of like this. I like looking back and seeing something that I made that I can actually lay in and and use, but this industry is, is kind of wonky like that. I think my greatest success is my family. Um, this is my wife. She would kill me because this photo is like five years old, So, but this is the only one I had. Sorry, honey. Um, my daughter, Casey, my son, Cooper, my daughter, Kendall, and Chase. Uh, we live in Lake Mary, right down the street. I'm a local guy. My kids are going to the elementary school I went to. I, got, I went to the high school my parents went to. My parents went to the high school my, their parents went to. Okay, where I live, I live within an hour of where I grew up. Um, I work within an hour of where I grew up. So I've tried to keep, the, even though I've traveled the world, I've tried to keep things tight and my community tight. And when you guys, I would suggest to you as you grow up and begin to plant roots, to try to do that. There's something very valuable as you grow up your children grow up to keep things close. Um, <clears throat> so, looking back on my time at Full Sail, I think, you know, for me, there was two modes of graduates coming out of school. There was the kids who, kind of what I call fast pass mode. I had a guy who sat next to me. His dad ran Warner Brothers. You know, like, this guy's going to be successful. I don't care how much of an idiot he is or how much of a jerk he is. He's going to go on to do something just because of who he knows. And so there was 85 people in my class. I could maybe put two of those people in that category. Most people, 
fit into this, the scratch and claw mode. You don't know anybody, nobody knows you, and you barely know anything, okay? And that's a great place to be. Quite honestly, I'd much rather be in this mode than that mode, although that mode's a lot quicker, I'll be honest. But I, I'll say this, if you do know somebody, use that. Don't, don't ever be as shy about that. I have people call me all the time like, hey man, you remember me? I knew you, we had met. I'm like, I kind of know you, but I don't, I don't know. But next thing you know, they're talking to me. So use that. If you do know somebody, use that. Scratch and claw mode. We should embrace this mode. This is a great place to be. Let me back up there. I don't want to play that yet. Scratch and claw, claw mode is a great place to be. It thickens your skin. It allows you to work with very little resources, which is an incredible skill to learn that will serve you dividends later in life. It gives you the tenacity. Like I said, it thickens your skin and it prepares you for this industry, which is the toughest industry to break into. When I married my wife, she came out of school with a five-year education. She was an occupational therapist. She was paid $5,000 as a sign-on bonus right out of college. Okay? It took me 10 years to make $40,000 a year Okay, in the video business, doing weddings, shooting whatever moved I would shoot. So there, there's a mentality there, a scrappiness that you guys kind of have to get into. A kind of, I'm doing this at all costs. It doesn't matter how long it takes, what it takes. I'm going to do this at all costs. And that is a great place to be. That will give you, that will serve you really well. This idea of, um, um, I thought about this because no great story starts off with, uh, the doctor said I would walk in two months, and I walked in two months. That's kind of a lame story, right? It's always, the doctor said I would never walk, and here it is, I'm walking. We as humans need that, what I call that angst. Someone who says, you can't do this. It's great that mom thinks you're great, and she thinks your stuff is great, and the people around you think you're great, but where's that truth, right? Right? Where's that something we can back up against and really kind of push up against and prove somebody wrong? Well, I did a little skit about this. I'll let you watch this. Oh, there's no uh, That's my main roll around. Let me back it up here. You gotta you gotta hear it from the beginning. We had it. Inspire my <laughs> great people have had someone in their life who told them they would fail. Okay, I'm gonna try this one more time. Bear with me here. It's kind of worth it. So then you're not gonna amount to much in life. And that really frustrates me. Inspiration. That's my main role around here. To inspire my employees to greatness. It's really kind of what I do. All great people have had someone in their life who told them they would fail, who told them they were a loser, um, that they would never be successful. And it's because of that person that they defied the odds and overcame and became great. He's a climber, you know what you are? Uh, tomato. I want to be that person for my employees. Brian, hear my words and hear them hard, okay? What you're doing right now, and everything that you do, you will never be good at that. But the thing is, I didn't realize that losing was your best friend. You know what, here's the deal, here's the problem. This is not good, and you are not good, and quite honestly, I don't know if you ever will be good. It's called reverse psychological motivation, and it's actually been around for a long time. It's all, it's all chronicled right here in this book, Motivation to Humiliation. A lot of pictures, I mean, it's a really just a good book that really, teaches you how to inspire and motivate your employees through the proper and legal use of humiliation. Okay, so we're kind of having fun with that, but the idea here is that embrace that. When somebody tells you you can't do something, use that. That is fuel. Seek 
those people out. People who say you can't do this, right? Use that as fuel. You want to be surrounded with people who can give and deliver raw, unbridled truth, right? You want that ash chewing just right over here, ready to go. That's a great, great place to be. We surround ourselves with people who stroke us, who tell us everything is great, and, oh, you're really great at this. Maybe you suck. You know, maybe you really suck at design. And you're a much better manager of designers than an actual designer. Well, man, wouldn't you love to have that information soon? Right? That's what we're talking about. Um, use obstacles to fuel your dream. You know, there's been many times in my life where, um, and it's hard to acknowledge those at the time, but it was those very obstacles that propelled me in a direction that was um, the direction that I needed to go. So when you guys are faced with obstacles, when you get out of school and you think you're supposed to do this, but something happens and now you're over here, you know, that's an obstacle, but use it. That's a good thing. Um, bust your ass for free and love it. That's what being a student is all about, especially in this industry. I have a lot of people who want to intern for me and like want to want to uh, work on our shows and stuff. And um, you know, hell, I worked for free for two or almost three years when I came out of school, and that's just kind of like I feel quite honestly that there is a paying of the dues. And I'm not so familiar with your industry, but I'm speaking primarily video and film production for people who want to be in this industry. Um, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want to do this? There's a whole lot of people who want to do what you're doing. They're lined up out the door. How bad do you want this? And have you put yourself in a place where you can work for free or next for nothing or gas money? You know, have you set yourself up for that? Or do you have so much that you're carrying that you're not in a place to do that? You know, do you have a mortgage and a lot of other stuff that you can't do? Try to free yourself up. When you come out of school, try to free yourself up to a place where you can be responsive and you can be there. I don't care about how much you, I don't care how much you're paying me. I don't want to know. I just want to be here. I want to learn. I want to show you what I can do. All right, we'll talk money later. You got plenty of time to make lots of money. Experience is king. Get as much of it as get it, just soak it up. Whatever it is. Just be this experience whore. Just get whatever you can. Now is the time to do this. Because the later on in life as your career develops, you get a little more narrower. Because here's the goal. The goal is to get to what you're great at as soon as possible. Because people don't pay for good, they pay for great. So the quicker you can get there, the better. All right, I mentioned Mr. S you got any fans in here? Mr. Science Theater? Mm-hmm. A couple closet fans. You know, when I was in film school, like, this is what I wanted to do. I had this letter where I wrote the producers of uh, Mr. Science Theater, said, man, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll, I'll go up there. I'll sleep in my truck. I, I'll do whatever it takes to just, to just serve you coffee. And I have that pinned up on my, my office as an example that I could look back on and see where I was at that time out of school, what I was willing to do. And it helps me to put things in perspective. For you guys coming out of school, have that, go big. Like who, who, who do you absolutely want to work for? Like what is your dream job? And just go for it. You may fall flat on your ass and you, you may not get there, but man, you've got to go for it. My motto with my team is we throw a bunch of stuff against the wall until something sticks. So whatever you think is big, go big. And just start there and work down. <coughs> of course, I didn't land the job there. I was quickly uh, overcome with the reality of having to make a living. So I made wedding videos for two years. But I was the best damn wedding videographer in Orlando. Okay, they call me the Quentin, Quentin Tarantino of, of video, of, video, of uh, wedding videos. We were shooting wedding videos on 8mm and all this crazy stuff. And, you know, we were trying to bring our style to that industry. Of course, I got burned out really fast and dropped it like a box of rocks. But it got me to where I wanted to go. It allowed me to stay in this industry. And that's the important part. 
You know, that's, it's that kind of tenacity that keeps you from going to go work for dad. Because that job's always going to be there. Why don't you come over here, son? Or go over here. You can be, well, how, gosh, you could be over here making a whole. Yeah, you could be a lot of places making a lot more money. But it's not what you want to do. It's not why you're here. Expect to be rerouted. This is one of those great um, things about life that you think you're moving in one direction, but you will be rerouted. Where you think you're going today, in 30 years, you'll look back and just laugh. And I can't believe I thought I was going to go work for Mystery Science Theater 3000. What the hell was I thinking? So whatever that is, plan on being rerouted. And that's a great thing. That's fine. As long as you're staying with what you want. Again, you're trying to get to what you're great at. Not what you're good at. What you're great at. And the goal is to get there as quick as possible. So you can start getting paid. Mm. Why I smash my smartphone. So... This picture right here represents uh, my love-hate relationship with my smartphone. These were the last three phones of mine. This was my last one that I ran over on purpose. This one over here went in, uh, I was fishing, and it was in my pocket. I didn't know about it. And that one, I don't know what happened to that one. Currently, I have a flip phone. Who in here has a flip phone? Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> So here's what happened to me. This is a little bit of a social experiment for me. Um, I was first in line when Apple came out with the smartphone. And I've had smartphones ever since then. As a creative individual, as somebody who makes their living up here with their mind, I continually found my cell phone prevented me from going where I needed to go, which was deep. I kept finding myself, um, and I'm a spiritual person too, as a Christian, spiritually, uh, creatively, I was unable to go deep with anything meaningful in life. It would continually to kick me out. I would start to go somewhere that was great, and I'd get kicked out by the myriad of things that would come up on that phone. I think, and this is something that kind of had been brewing in me for quite some time, and I was thinking about it. I used to be a, a daydreamer in school, in life. I would just, just daydream and just go deep in thought. And I miss that place. I miss that place of really going deep with my thinking. And uh, I was driving, and I almost got in a really bad accident with my phone. I had my face in my phone. I looked up. The car was in front of me. I locked the brakes up. Scared the hell out of me. I said, I can't do this anymore. I put it down. I said, I'm not going to mess with the phone anymore. 20 minutes later, I had it in my face again. I was like, holy shit, Like, what the hell is going on? This thing has got a hold of me, and I didn't like that. And so a little bit of a social experiment, I smashed it. My wife freaked out. The people around me kind of freaked out. And I went into Walmart and got a flip phone. The big numbers, like the senior citizens that wear it, yeah. And uh, I tell you what, for the first five days, there was a lot of anxiety. Um, I got lost a lot. Uh, try driving without your cell phone, your smartphone, just as an experiment. Try leaving your phone at home and try driving to the grocery store and drive home. Just try it. It'll freak you out a little bit. And that should freak you out. Not having that phone next to me freaked me out. One day, two days, three days. My wife's freaking out because she says she can't get in touch with me. Um, what's, what's crazy with the flip phone, is some of you guys remember, that you know, texting on it just sucks. It, it's just ridiculous. Like you can't text on a, on a, especially if you've come from a smartphone. Luckily, there's these preloaded texts in there, you know? It's like, uh, I love you, and I'll see you in five minutes, and where are you at, and like all these preloaded texts. So my wife 
is texting me, and I just use the I love you for everything. So she's like, you know, hey, be home in five minutes. How are the kids? Like, I love you. You know, like, uh, hey, can you pick up a gallon of milk? I love you. And so that's my only text to her. It basically acknowledges, hey, I got your text. I hear you, and I love you. Right? That's, that's kind of a thing. It was really nice because I come home one day and she's like smiling, beautiful dress, and she's like, I love you. I'm like, oh, wow, she loves me. It's nice. Um, you should try that. Um, I found my ability as a creative stunned. And I found me being what I call a mile wide and an inch deep, where I was so spread out. And for somebody who's supposed to make their money, off of my mind, my ability to create something great. you got to go deep to create something great. And for those of you in this room who are going to make money with your mind, with your ability to go deep and to think about something that no one else has thought about, to create a character that nobody else has dreamed of, like what is it going to take? It's going to take you going deep. And I would submit that the sea of distractions primarily coming from our cell phone prevents us from doing that. I think one of the greatest challenges you in this room will have is your ability to pump the brakes on the industry that you feed. Your ability to create boundaries and create places for you to go deep. For me, I love out the outdoors. That's where I go. I go out in the woods. I go canoeing. I go camping. It is that reset for me, that refresh that I long for. So, I don't recommend this for everybody, <laughs> but I will say, and I'll probably get a smartphone here eventually in the next, you know, I've been about, about six months without it. And it's embarrassing. My children are mortified, you know, wherever we go. Um, I set it on the table and people are like, what in the hell is that? Is that a pager? I'm like, no. It's just, hey, Ben, can I get a little bit more water? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, and it's, you know, and, and I do a lot of speaking with uh, parents and young parents about, um, about this topic, and there's nothing wrong with technology. This is, what, I mean, this is what we do. I mean, I make a TV show. I get the irony here, okay? My son brings that to my attention quite often. He's like, you realize, Dad, you make a TV show that airs on a screen, and this is, you know, I get that. And to me, it's not about the debunking of that or denying yourself of that. It is about finding that balance. It's about acknowledging the power that this has over you and for you as a creative to understand that, to understand that what, is, what do you have to do to put your, yourself in a place where you can come up with something great? What is that? For each one of you, it's a little bit different. You know, but acknowledge that. Call it out for what it is. If this is affecting your ability to do something great, then do something about it. Fix it. Flip it. S- smash it. Do whatever you have to do. Get control over it, because if not, it will, I, I, I was uh, speaking at Full Sail, and I, I was talking about this, and this, two kids came up and said, um, I watch so much stuff online that I think to myself, I could never create that. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, that's where you don't want to be. You know, watching so much stuff will will uh, paralyze you. We'll get here into that, to that here in a little bit. Uh, so cons, I talked about some of the cons, the pros. I absolutely found my thoughts. I started to daydream again. Heck, I even started to talk to myself, which I hadn't done in a while. You know, I started to be able to go deep and think of things that I would have never have thought about. I developed a whole TV show from this. I was able to... Uh, um, redirect our company and come up with you know, a lot of different ideas of things that I wanted to do. 
So try it. Social experiment. Not permanently. Try it in your life. See what happens. Uh, again, this is something that I think um, this generation will kind of have to come to terms with. I talked about more mind time. I had uh, more real conversations. I tell people, don't text me, call me. I had real conversations with people. You can get so much more done, at least I've acknowledged, in a five-minute conversation than a three-hour barrage of texts. Because here's the deal. Those three hours, you know, where somebody's texting you, you got multiple people, like, where's your time? Where's your time? Where's your time to do something great? Are you allowing people to interrupt your time? As a creative, you need to, be, you need to learn to be very stingy with your time. Because your time and your mind is very important to you and your industry. So what is that time? Create that time for yourself where it's your time. Your time to come up with something great. Um, I love life in contrast. When I make TV, I want to see contrast. I want people to go from laughing to smiling to crying to in inspired. I think life is best served when it's served in contrast. And so I would suggest to you to live your life in contrast. To go from this crazy tech world to out into the woods. Some of your best inspiration. You guys are creating environments here. Digital environments. Go into that environment. Be a frequenter of that environment. Know that environment. So live your life in contrast. One of my good friends who owns a, a big company here, uh, Purple Rock Scissors, who's a digital wacko kid, you know, I love taking him out into the woods because here it is, this guy who lives his life connected to the internet, making apps and all this stuff, and he loves it too. He loves that contrast of being out where there's no Wi-Fi and there's just nothing out there. So look for those moments in your life to, to find that sharp contrast. It will jar your creativity. It will, it, will, it will put things in front of you that have not and aren't, aren't there right now. Do, create, and consume. You'll notice that the logo for How to Do Florida, the only capitalized letter is the D for do. A big component of do. Um, when I come in and my, my kids are sitting around like, what are you doing? I'm watching this. No, what are you doing? Like, uh, you got to be doing something. And I probably push them a little too hard on this, but like, as a human, what are you doing? Um, this is something that I've noticed uh, with me, is this consumption versus creation balance. You know, when I was young... Um, and I've built my life off of creating things. You guys in this room will make a living, a living creating something. That is, getting on your computer and creating something for others to consume. Well, one of the things that we've, we've kind of gotten off of kilt is this, we consume more than we create. Because consuming is so much more easy, or so easier, or however that is. It's easy to consume. And I'm talking about being entertained. I'm talking about Netflix. I'm talking about just letting there and just letting it wash over you. I'm talking about just plopping there and doing jack. It's so much easier to sit there and consume than it is to create, isn't it? Because create, hey, we're all creatives. We're insecure and we're, we're thin-skinned. And, you know, like to create is to put yourself out there. It's to be vulnerable. It's not a good place to be. It's much easier to consume and critique than it is to create. And I would submit that that balance is off. That we as a society have gotten so good at consuming that sometimes that consumption can paralyze us from creating. So those of you in this room have, have the biggest challenge of that. To set that balance of creating way more than you consume. I have this saying of, 
you know, when I started my shows and I kind of went out to create an entertainment company, that ignorance is bliss. And I truly believe that. Uh, I don't want to watch other TV shows. In fact, I didn't. When I was starting to make TV shows, I didn't watch TV at all. I isolated myself from that world. I don't want to know what the latest and greatest is. I don't want to know the latest TV shows. I want to be in my own little world and truly create something original. Because that's how you create something original, right? You're not influenced. It is you. It is raw. It is unbridled you. Unadulterated. And to do that, you kind of have to isolate yourself. You have to say, I'm not going to sit here and watch TV all day and get up and say, now I'm ready to make a TV show. Because you're not. You're, you're discouraged. You're like, they're already doing everything. Everything's already been done. And they do it so well. There's no way I can do what they're doing. Uh, you know, I'll do it next week. You have to protect yourself from that. And you have to put your head down, block that crap out, and go and create something truly authentic, truly that is from you. One of the greatest compliments I ever got was people would come up to me and say, hey man, your show's kind of like, have you seen that show? And I'm like, I've never seen that show. Oh, your show's kind of like, it's got that, and it's, it's almost like this other show. I'm like, I haven't seen any of those shows. And it was so great to have not seen those. And so they're like, yeah, I did see that show. Yeah, I kind of put that in there. That show, I love that show. Yeah, I sprinkled some of that in there. And did you see how I ended it? That was creating something original, something that's truly you. You have to isolate yourself. I talked about ignorance is bliss. Um, I truly think that uh, what separates those who do from those who critique the doers. You know, we live in this kind of critique world, right? We comment, we like, it's this world of like critique. But man, we have got to be in that place where we have the self-confidence to be those creators, people who are making what's being critiqued, right? That's who we are. We're creators, we're doers, we're makers. We're not critiquers. We're not consumers. We make things. It's one thing this country does really well is we make stuff. And those of you in this room have to have that in your head, that you're a maker, you're not a consumer. What am I doing sitting around watching this? I should be making this. <coughs> Who's heard of this book, Making Ideas Happen, by Scott Blansky? I would suggest everybody in here read this book. Um, it absolutely helped me um, understand how a creative makes something happen. Creatives are funny individuals, right? We're uh, we have these ideas, and you know we want to we want to make something happen. But uh, having an idea and executing on that idea are two Totally different things. And you in this room of anybody should know that. How long it takes to make a video game or to design something. Having something in your mind and executing on that is two different things. And it is what separates successful and unsuccessful people in this world. I see stuff on the TV all the time and people are like, man, that show sucks. Man, I can't believe they, they Discovery picked up that show. I'm like, the only difference between them and you, is they're doing it. I don't care how much it sucks. Their show's on TV, and yours is not. Okay? So, great book. Uh, Scott Balancey, he basically um, interviewed a bunch of different companies and kind of charted the evolution of an idea from its infancy, like when it's born, and the plateau of the execution, and, and what all that looks like. And for those of you in this room who have a big idea or trying to make something, you know, later in life when you get that place where you're able to maybe go off on your own and do something great, you know, getting something from an idea 
and taking it through execution and testing and all the stuff that has to happen to, to launch is really why we do this. I mean, to see something be born, I've never been pregnant. I don't know what being pregnant's like. But it's got to be something like that. To see something incubate like that and then to give birth to that and see it hopefully succeed or maybe fall, fall on its face and you do it again a little bit better next time. It's not about ideas, it's about making ideas happen, which is really kind of the gist of his book. And as creatives, it's tough because we want pats on the back. We're typically insecure people who want someone to say, oh, you've got a great idea, you know? Or you'd pitch your idea, I had this great idea for, you know, we can do this, this video game is this, these guys attack, and it's just, you know, and then we get a couple of our buddies to say, that's a really great idea, you should do it. And then it's like, ah, I came up with a great idea. Awesome. And then that's it. Don't be the guy who has all these ideas but can never execute on them. You want to lose cred in your industry? Have a bunch of ideas but never show the tenacity or the wherewithal to execute on them. There's a lot of separation there from somebody who has an idea and from somebody who can actually execute on an idea. You know, I've had a lot of great ideas in my time. This was my uh, curler kid, the only workout that grows with you. This was a five-point harness that you put on your kid that you can work out with your kid as they grow. You can do uh, lifts here. You can do over-the-head presses. This one never quite got off the ground, but still in the development phase. I also had aroma lid. I hate lids that Starbucks gives you because I like to smell my coffee. So I created a lid that has a, the aroma comes through the lid, right? Not a bad idea. Yeah, someone's already doing it. And then I had... Yes. It's water in a bottle, but it tastes like it's right out of a hose. I call it hose fina. Okay. Okay, who's had hose water here, right? A few people, right? I was raised on hose water. I thought for surely I could sell some of this, right? <laughs> Guys like Ben and me out there want to taste a hose water? I had a hose, bottle it right from the tap. Didn't take off. Um, and the reason why, because I wasn't, these are kind of silly, but I wasn't passionate about these ideas, right? They're just things, little gaps, little holes, I think, are out there in the world that I could fill. Uh, maybe make some quick money, whatever. When you're thinking about your idea, you know, Choose something that you're incredibly passionate about because you will always need that to fall back on. I'm not passionate about coffee lids. I'm not passionate about, you know, curl a kid. But one thing I was passionate about was Florida. I lived here my whole life. I'm a third generation Florian. I love this state in a kind of a weird way. For most of you in here who probably are not from Florida, statistically 70% of you in this room are not from Florida. You know, in a school like this, it's probably higher, more like 85%. But I love this state. And I love families. I, I think that um, now more than ever, our world needs uh, good families, good places for kids to grow up, good environments for kids to grow up. So I'm going to do a TV show around Florida. I wanted to show people my Florida. That was my deal. That was my goal. That was my big idea. And off I went <clears throat> to create a TV show. Now, the idea was the easy part. Um, I had pitched this idea to a bunch of people. In fact, I gathered a lot of people. And at this point, I had had a video production company. We were very successful. We were doing a lot of stuff with Reebok and Audi and Bank of America, making commercials. And But I just got bored with that. Um, there was something about that that kind of ate away at my soul. And I wanted to create something that not only I owned, but had the potential to have an impact. I didn't care about selling more shoes or more cars. It, that got old, and it became insignificant to me. It was just a place to make money. I wanted to do something bigger. And I wanted to create my own TV show. So I gathered some people around and said, well, here's what I want to do. Told them the model, 
And I had five guys there, and four of them told me I was crazy because I was about to take out a $100,000 loan to do this, second mortgage on our house. And um, four of them told me I was crazy. One of them said it might work. I'll never forget him. And uh, getting back to what I was talking about, motivation through humiliation, I got up from that table and knew this is what I want to do. For the reasons that I had mentioned earlier, these guys basically said that I couldn't do what I wanted to do because it's not being done. Whenever you're out there and somebody says that to you, know that you're on to something great. When somebody's saying to you, I don't know if you can do what you're doing. It's not been done. Keep moving in that direction. That's a good place to be. You know you're on to something big. Constraints. I had $100,000 to work with. I was told I need a half a million. All I could come up with is $100,000 to start this show. And uh, the first season, I spent $175,000. I, sp- I raised $36,000 in sales. It was a disaster. Uh, second season, I raised $258,000. And uh, the show cost me $170,000. So I made a little bit of money. By third season, I was making really good money. Today I have three television shows that are sponsor driven. So these aren't shows on Discovery. And I've tried to get shows on Discovery. And they've actually was looking at one of my shows. And uh, this producer came up to me and said, hey man, I think what you're doing is, is working and I would stay doing what you're doing. When you sell this show to Discovery, you are out. And you'll have no control over this show. I'm like, but it's my show. Uh Uh-uh, not anymore. When Discovery buys your show, it's done. They're in the seat. You're just a, they don't care about you. And so I backed off of that and have become um, comfortable with this model of sponsor-driven content. And that's what we do. We have three television shows that we produce. We also produce a lot of nationally syndicated specials. All around family, being outdoors, reconnecting through outdoors, I have a How to Do Florida show, which is our flagship show. And then we have a kid show called The Outsiders Club. And then we have a a yard show called Flip My Florida Yard. Um, But this took a long time to get there. I firmly believe that one of the reasons I was successful is because I used what I call blood money, which is money that I borrowed and also money that I borrowed from my parents and my wife's parents. This is being recorded, so I don't know if everybody knows that, but it's okay. (laughs) But at some point, with your big idea, you've got to put skin in the game. You've got to have some of your money on the line. And whether you go to your parents, which I would not suggest, or however you get the money, it has got to be blood money. It has got to be money that you feel so committed to paying this back. This has got to work. Where every dollar is stretched to the nines. It's got to be that kind of money. And man, that that is such a great place to be where you're supposed to have a half a million, but all you have is a hundred thousand. And you're, you know, it's why Quentin Quentin Tarantino, a lot of these guys can't get back to those early days of making films when they had nothing. And that's when they created greatness. As soon as they became great and they had endless budgets. You see what happened. So, that, so, so cherish that time when you have uh, minimal resources, so little to work with. That is a sweet, sweet time for a creative. Embrace that. Um, what else do I want to talk about here? Hire people you would never hang out with. This is something that I had to learn the hard way. You know, I wanted to be, I wanted to hire people that I liked being with. I thought we'd all be we buddies. We'd go have beers afterwards. It'd be a great thing. That is not a good environment to run a company. Um, I learned very quickly I had to hire people who I quite honestly didn't really like, or I would never, I wouldn't say I didn't like them, that I would never hang out with them. Again, that they were willing to tell me unbridled truth. And oh, I hated that. Oh, I hated that. I hated that they would challenge me at the time I did. Now I see the value in it. Hire people, put people around you who will challenge you, who really don't care who you are or that you're the boss, but that will challenge you with with, with respect, but they will challenge you with what you say or what you're doing. That is a very important thing to have around you as you're trying to build something. 
I don't know what this is. There's a Florida most have never seen until now. This is a fish of a lifetime. My name is Chad Crawford. I'm an adventure seeker and a lover of all things Florida. My mission? To show you how to experience authentic Florida. Florida chef Justin Terminary will prepare oh, world-class oh, recipes. Fresh and yummy. Using the best ingredients fresh from Florida. Everything I love in the <coughs> dish. So sit back oh, yeah. as we show you how to do Florida. All right. How are we doing on time here, Ben? He's been. What, what time was this supposed to be over? Three? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so 15. Here's my 15 golden nuggets. There might be 16 there. I might have added one. Here we go. A um, little bit of a recap. Marry well. Like, <laughs> like your wife or your husband before you love them. Let me, let me rephrase that. Like goes a much further than love. Okay? I genuinely like my wife. We were talking about this last night and how liking somebody goes so much further when you're doing the day-to-day. -day. We have four kids. It's crazy in my house, all right? It's pandemonium. People think I'm, like, I'm Amish and I make furniture or something, like, you know, or like, a, I don't know. But we have four kids, and so it's crazy. So when you're choosing your spouse, make sure this is someone that you genuinely like. Not the, not the person that if you can tweak them a little bit, then you'll like them. Like, you just like being with this person. And oh, by the way, you love them. You know, that will carry you so much further. We've met so many couples, they're just like, I just hate him. He just, everything he does, he just despises me. I was like, oh my gosh, like, you generally just do not like this person. Oh, I hate him, I hate him. So, make sure you like the person you love and that they appreciate who you are and what you do. Creatives in this room, you know, you'll probably marry somebody who's different than you, who's a little more analytical or who's, you know, who doesn't get what you do. Make sure they get what you do and they understand what you do. And more importantly, they respect what you do. You've got to earn that respect. If you don't know, ask. Uh, this is something I deal with a lot of new people in there, and they pretend like they know because they don't want to ask, you know. If you don't know, how to plug something in, ask. If you don't know where this is, like, ask. Um, just something of... Logos don't matter. I spent way too much time in my life tweaking logos, dialing logos in. Uh, logos don't matter. Uh, there's this old adage of a quality product creates its own demand. That's what you should be focused on, a quality product. You're, you, you should do as an experiment. Make your logo the most ridiculous, stupidest thing in the world, okay? Just to spite, just to show people that it's the product that matters, not the logo or not the branding. It's the product. Be on time all the time until you're good enough to be late. Those of you in this room, when you're starting a job as an employer, there is nothing that grinds me more than someone who just rolls in, okay? If you say you're gonna be there at nine, or if I've told you to be there at nine, you better be there at nine or have a damn good excuse. When you're good enough, then you can be late. When you're making enough money, then you can roll in, drop your bag, go grab you a cup, cup of coffee. Oh, he's here, he's here, you know. But until then, you need to be on time. Now, that's something that's gotten lost in our society. People work with people they like, period. Be likable. I don't care how smart you are, how good you are. Nobody wants to work with a jerk or someone who thinks they're God's gift to whatever. Be likable will take you really far in life. Then you got to be good too, right? You can't just be likable. Business 101, money in needs to be greater than money out. That's business right there. Like it's cash flow. Cash is king. When you're running your business, that's what it's all about. My big old, you know, I, I've, I've run businesses from me and a, three or four people up to 15 employees. And uh, I have a spreadsheet and it's as simple as that. It's what do we got coming in and what's going out and what's left over. That's really what it comes down to when you're talking about running a business. Obviously there's a lot more detail there, but 
Um, that is the... Uh, Knowing what you don't want is more valuable than knowing what you do. And I say this too, I, this is something that I've learned in my life. Um, know what you don't want. As you go through life, you'll experience things like, okay, oh, I don't want that. Or that's a bad relationship, or uh, I don't want to work with that guy, or I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. Knowing that is really valuable, because that will get you to knowing what you do want. <coughs> create more than you consume. We talked about that a little earlier. Minimize your exposure to media. I know this sounds crazy tell, telling you guys this. It will paralyze you. Minimize yourself. Minimize it. Always face the reality of your situation head on. This is getting back to finances. When you're running a company... One thing that would scare the hell out of me for the longest time was looking at our bank account. And I knew then I was in trouble. When you're afraid to look at your bank account, because that is, that is truth, okay? It is absolute, unbridled truth. And when you're afraid to look at that, you got a problem, all right? Whatever you're facing, face it head on. Don't skirt it. Don't put it off. Face it head on, whether it's a dispute, something with, something relationally, we don't care what it is. Financials, deal with it head on. Don't put it off. The key to success is time served in this industry. It is time served. That's really what it is. It's hanging in there. We talked about this earlier. Doing whatever you got to do to stay in this industry. And it's just a matter of time. It's not about a big break. It's not about being catapulted. It is about time served. It is about doing your time, hanging in there. Eventually, you'll find success. Show up. 99% of success is showing up. I have interns who want to intern with me. I say, show up. We start work every morning at 9 o'clock. Show up. Very few of them do. Taking a great photograph is easy. Getting to that mountaintop at 4.30 in the morning that was the work. Taking the picture is easy. Putting yourself in that place is what's hard. Showing up, being where you're supposed to be. Not being afraid to show up. Always look for ways to break rules. Um, I'm always telling my team, what, are, what, what rules are we breaking? It's supposed to be in focus. What happens if we take it out of focus? The light's supposed to be here. What happens if we turn that light off? We're supposed to shoot it from this angle. What happens if we shoot it from over here? Always look for things, ways to break rules. This is, you're in the creative industry. Your job is to break rules, okay? You guys know what the rules are to keep you in bounds, but your job is to show me something I haven't seen, to do something that hasn't been done. And to do that, sometimes you've got to break rules. You just notice on television nowadays, every commercial... They have a big 5K in the background pointing right at the lens. You know, this is this, you know, five years ago, it was unheard of to have a lens flare in your lens. They would make things all around the lens to prevent the lights from flaring the lens. Now it's like, you can't get enough lights into the lens. So it's a great example of, that was a fundamental rule of video and film. You don't point a light at a lens. That rule has been broken. What other rules can you break? that will you know, create something new and original. When you hear this, that's not how it's done. You know you're doing something great. We talked about that earlier, right? Try to do something to get somebody to say that. Get to what you're great at as soon as possible. We talked about that. Reinvent yourself every five years. I get bored with stuff, like, okay, I've done this. I was telling you, I've done corporate video. I'm making commercials. Great. What else? Okay, now I want to create an entertainment company, and I want to, I want to make my own content. In five years, I'm like, what else? I want to own a TV station. I want to own a network. What, what else is there? Reinvent yourself every five years. But what else do you want to do? You've done this. You made a couple video games. What's next? Let's... let's Let's take what I learned and let's do something different. Let's flip 
everything I know, flip my environment, force me to learn something new, let's do something different. What is success? You know, for me, I think success has been finding a balance between um, my family, my passions, um, the people around me, and having all that work together. There is no separating family and work. It's all meld together. And how you balance that in life, your relationships, your passions as a creative, how you prepare your mind to do something great and set yourself up for success, you know, that will define how successful you are in life. And that's all I got. Oh, uh, go and do. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Anybody have any questions or anything? I guess that's kind of it. Yes, ma'am. Are there any beaches that you recommended? <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up on New Smyrna Beach. It's the closest. It's it's a great beach. Um, you can drive on it, which is a little weird for some people. But um, another beach straight down from that is Cape Canaveral. If you want total isolation. I think you're even allowed to run around there naked, too. Like at the very end of um, Bethune is a place called Canaveral National Seashores. It's a, it's a national park you can go into. Beautiful, and there'll be nobody on that beach. So you have something that's really isolated in New Smyrna, which is a little more populated, a little more kind of surf city style. All right. <laughs> Any more? Yes, sir. Starting up like your own thing here, or going out and getting some experience first before you would like say say I wanted to start my own video game studio in mm -hmm. Orlando. Would I would I um, would it be better for me to just go and do that, or go out and and experience working for other people first? The latter, because you need to see what he's doing or she's doing, and take it middle middle notes. You need to get a picture of what it looks like to run something like that. And so that you can take that knowledge, tweak it. I would have done that, and I would probably do this. I like what she did, but I would take that, do that for a couple years, and then with that knowledge, I will say one thing, though. Be honest with the person that you're hiring that you want to do this. You know, I think you know, as a creative, hiring other creatives, you're always a little insecure about somebody who's going to come into your company and gleam from what you're doing, and then they're gone, and they've taken some of your identity or some of your demos, and now they're presenting them as their own. I'll look at what I did, even though you were just in the room for a couple minutes. So I think for you, be honest. Say, hey, you know, one of these days, I'd love to have my own, you know, video game studio. They're going to say, oh, good luck. And they're going to be like, you know, but be honest with that person about what your intentions are. Because they're going to ask you, what do you want to do? And you need to be truthful with that question. You know, because that person needs to know what your intentions are and what you want to do. So, yeah. Anything else? Anything? Yes, sir. Yeah. But then he's doing something else, a different job maybe, just to please himself and his family. Now he wants to like go take that road, but if he takes that road, there isn't like, like he, he can't like feed himself and his family. So what is that person to attack? Is this person you? Not exactly. Okay, okay. How young is this person? Um, maybe around uh, 23. Do they have a, a family and children and stuff? Okay, well, as long as they don't have any real responsibilities of what I mean by that are like a mortgage or family to feed, then go do that. You being young is the time to fail. You want to go, you want to fail, you want to be bankrupt when you're young. Okay, you want to do, you want to get all the stupid stuff out of you when you're young. Now, if he has a family and he has children to feed, then no. He, he, that is a much 
a bigger responsibility than his dream at the time. Okay, And so that dream is going to have to wait, or it's going to have to be kind of spoon-fed over time. Okay, But he's first and foremost obligated to take care of those immediate... immediate because what will happen is if he goes and does that and fails, he's going to lose those valuable relationships, and then you're not going to have nothing. So you've got to invest in what's good, what's real, and then slowly foster and bring them on board to foster your dream. It's just going to take longer. You know, so I don't know if that's helpful, but anything, anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, sir. I had a question about when it comes to having an idea, having to want to have a business for yourself, and if you decide to go work for somebody else, and then along the line you get yourself situated to you have a position to create your own business, mm -hmm. um, what, if, what would you do in a situation where a previous employer would try to take legal action against you saying that they own those ideas you created? When you create your own business. Yeah, that's tough, isn't it? Because ideas are ideas, you know what I mean? And we talked about earlier, it's easy to have an idea. Um, and that idea, is, it can it just on its own, is very cheap unless it's developed or unless it's shown to be marketable. Um, you know, I think you have to kind of protect yourself along the way. I think you have to um, know that do the best you can to document along the way what you did and what you contributed so that you can prove that later. But, you know, ultimately people are hiring you. When you go out, you know, they don't really want to know what you did at some other place. Like that is, is, has some value, but you need to be looking forward. You need to be casting way bigger vision of what you want to do and where you want to go and not be so hung up on some things you did in the past. You know, you don't want to get caught in that nitty-gritty, this was my idea, no it wasn't, you weren't there, yes I was. You want to, you want to go way beyond that, you know. Um, but, I, I mean, there is some validity to being able, and we do a lot of legal stuff with ideas and show ideas and stuff, and there's, you have to protect yourself. And to the point you could even hire a lawyer to kind of help you navigate some of that, you know. But that just gets weird. You know, I don't want somebody working for me who's got, you know what I mean, that I'm feeling like this person is going to take off and take something. You know, if you're a team player and you're there, like I've had employees who wanted to go do their own thing. And they were good employees. And they truly were talented. And I said, go, take, take whatever you want. Take this, you, say, you can say you did this, take all the footage, because they're good people. And I still use those, pe those people from now on. So if you're good at what you do and you have a lot of respect, you, know, you should be okay as long as you do it right. And you're not just an ass about it, you know? Yeah. Okay, Any, anything else? Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And back to class or whatever you guys do next. Whatever, go. <laughs> <laughs>